Deanna Davidson. Welcome to Acting Prime Minister. And thanks for having us here in what is your temporary office, because you're still getting set up, aren't you? So I'm a squatter in this office at the moment. Um, yeah, we're, we're waiting our official allocation, um, but some kind souls who are sitting behind me um, took pity on us and offered us some desk space. So we've managed to set up kind of temporary camp here, uh, but hopefully, excitingly, we'll be getting our office this afternoon, which we're really excited about. And I think a lot of people don't realise that when you become a new MP, there is all this admin and HR stuff you've got to do, isn't there? You have to find a new office, you have to hire staff. What's that been like for you? I think that's been probably the toughest bit so far, because there's a lot you know you're going to have to do, and you're going to have to learn how the chamber works and go and do votes and meet with your whips and all that sort of stuff, um, and all the constituency stuff on top of that. But it's the fact that you know we have to put together the contracts for our staff you know I, I had no idea that that was something that I would have to do I mean maybe it's obvious but it wasn't to me um, things like you know finding offices in your constituency you knew you'd have to do it but it's when you get looking at the ins and outs of kind of mm. the tenancy agreements and that sort of stuff it's a little bit above my head but I'm quite grateful to have some good people around me who do know what they're doing in that regard so I can delegate and I'm getting better at delegating as well which I think is a probably a good skill for an MP to have. And in terms of Parliament more generally, what, what have been your first impressions coming down here and starting as an MP? Um, it's very surreal. So I worked here quite a while ago, like five or six years ago, um, and I had, a, I had a pass but not a stripy one. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was able to wander around a bit and you, know, you do kind of soak in the splendour of it and it is a very impressive place. But when you come down and you're able to kind of access all areas and you can go and sit on those green benches for the first time, it's a really remarkable feeling. Um, I know for me, the first time I sat on the benches, I kind of had this moment of, um, I wouldn't really know what to call it, but this amazing moment where I just kind of reminisced on everything that had got me to that point. You know, like all the times I'd been around the constituency, the conversations I'd had, the people I'd spoken to, the people I'd helped, and how that had all culminated in that sort of one moment of me finally planting my bum on those green seats. And you are only 26, and you're probably sick of people saying that to you. But do you kind of notice your age around here? Because for an MP, that is very young. So it's, it's young on paper. Um, I think the head on my shoulders is a little bit older. Um, but the only time I've really noticed it, it was my first week when I kept getting mistaken for a staffer by lots of the kind of door staff and the security staff. Um, a few times I got questioned why I was going into members' lobby. I was like, no, no, I've got a stripey one. I am, I am one of the MPs. Um, so in that regard, yes. But... Otherwise, not really. I mean, I'm still getting the same level of respect from my colleagues that all the other new intakes seem to be getting. Um, and it just means I'm perhaps a little bit better on social media as well, which is a bit of an asset, I think, in this day and age. <laughs> OK, well, we'll look, we're going to fast track your career even further now and possibly the fastest ever entry into Downing Street <laughs> a month after you were elected. for everybody at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're going to put you through that Downing Street door. Okay. And we'll give you some time to settle in first. So as you're getting your office together, I mean, you haven't got any photos up here because this is your temporary one, but is there a picture that you think you'd hang maybe behind your desk in Downing Street? Um, so I love pictures and posters and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I would have to have a picture of my dad, who was such a massive source of inspiration, and my nan as well. They were both really made me who I am. So they would be up there. Um, and then I'd probably go totally the other way and have a big picture of Taylor Swift. Oh, really? some <laughs> brilliant quote from one of her songs because she is an absolute hero and uh, I find her quite inspirational as well. What is it that, about Taylor Swift that inspires you and how much she transferred to politics, do you think? Um, well, I, I mean, partly it was just I loved her music and I kind of grew up with her music because she grew, I grew and, you know, felt a sort of connection to Taylor all the way through my teenage years and getting into my early 20s. Um, but what I've really seen from her over the last few years is her... Uh, political activism so she's become an incredible advocate for LGBT rights and hasn't been afraid to kind of stick her head above the parapet on that despite some of the abuse that she's received um, sometimes from quite long-standing fans so I really respect that I will respect anyone who stands up for a really good cause and isn't afraid to champion it. Okay that is a refreshing idea normally people put pictures on the wall of I don't know Margaret Thatcher or something <laughs> but Taylor Swift is a good one. What is the drink that you'd like to pour yourself? It doesn't have to be alcoholic I should probably stress yeah, but yeah. I, I keep feeling like I'm encouraging everyone to have an alcoholic drink. <laughs> Um, I would probably, I probably would though. I'd probably have like half a cider. I'm, I, okay. I love my cider, like a good cider, but I've got small hands. So I usually drink halves for that reason. Small hands and I'm a lightweight, so it's safer <laughs> to stick to the halves. So prob probably that. And who would you love to pick up the phone to? It'd have to be my mum, obviously. I mean, mm. um, she's been brilliant. The way that she supported me um, as a kid, you know, when we had some very difficult times. Um, and yeah, she, she would have to be the first person I rung to say, Mum, you will never guess where I am. 
though I would hope she'd been following things closely enough to know that I was there before I arrived. She but, might you have know. seen you on telly walking in the door. Maybe, but. maybe. Um, and let's talk a bit about your path to power because you've mentioned a little bit about your childhood there. Mm -hmm. And it, it was t tough for you, wasn't it? Because yeah. you lost your dad when you were 13. Yes. Just tell us a bit about what happened to him. Um, so it was just a sort of Saturday night like any other. He'd gone to the pub for a few drinks with his pals. I was staying at my nan's. Um, we got a phone call probably about half past nine, ten o'clock saying Dominic's passed out, um, you need to come down to the pub. But by the time we got there, the ambulance had already arrived to take him away, so we followed the ambulance to the hospital. And it was a real confused time because none of us really knew what had happened. Um, you know, my, my dad's friends who he was out with, they'd, they'd had a few drinks. I wouldn't say they were drunk, but they were a little bit whoa, 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 and a bit overwhelmed by everything. Mm -hmm. So by the time we got to the hospital, we were just kind of shoved into a waiting room. Um, and we were there for, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, waiting to hear what had happened. And we, we were very out of the loop. Um, and the doctors came in and said they couldn't resuscitate him. And uh, that was it, which was awful. It was so unexpected. Um, I mean, losing any family member is horrific. But when it's such a shock, like, you know, literally just like that, um, it was only 35. And what had happened, uh, we found out later, was a guy had wandered across the pub punched my dad once, um, sort of hit him in the side of the head, and it had ruptured a blood vessel which flooded his brain, and that was it. So just one punch? Yes. And then you lost your dad in, in a matter of minutes? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why, I mean, I am so uh, anti-violence, um, something that you know I'm hoping to kind of work on here in Parliament, but um, sometimes people don't necessarily realise what consequences their actions could have. So I, I don't for a second think that the guy was, you know, had the intention to kill my dad, of course I don't. I don't know what his intention was, but I can you know, pretty much guarantee it wasn't that. But the fact of the matter is, you know, the spillover effect was that my dad died and we lost you know, a really valued member of the family. Um, so for that to happen at 13, was, uh, yeah, it, was, it was pretty tough. And do you feel that loss now, now that you're an MP, because coming down here is a big change? And it's the kind of thing, you know, I'd want to pick up the phone to my dad, I guess, and talk to him about it. Do you feel that? Yeah, I mean, I do, but I suppose because it was so long ago, there have been quite a few milestones that have happened since I was 13. So, you know, A-level results, first in the family to go to uni, graduating from uni, getting married. Um, all of those things were really big events where dad really should have been there. You know, mm. in the normal scale of things, dad would have been there. Um, so I think I'm a bit more immune to that now um, in the sense that, you know, it's, it's kind of just a given that he's not here. Um, but there are moments, there are moments where I'd kind of like to ring him up and ask him what to do, and he was a real joker, so I can't even imagine some of the stuff he'd be saying to me now, you know. What do you think you'd say to him? <laughs> what would I say to him? Oh, God. Um, I don't even know. You know, I, I, I'd, I, I think I would be so kind of shocked to have him back that I'd probably just be totally flabbergasted and speechless, but I just want to thank him, really, for instilling in me the values that have driven me to get me here. Um, so he was a grafter, you know, he was so determined and 100% believed in aspiration. My family, we, we didn't have much, but you know, we all knew that if we worked that little bit harder, then we could, we could get somewhere, we could really make something of ourselves. So that kind of ethos is the reason that I'm here today. So I just thank him for that. Because he was a stonemason, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah, and your mum was? She was a nursery famous, nurse, yeah. did a whole range of jobs, but nursery nurse was uh, what she settled on, and she's very good at it as well. So how did you then get interested in politics from that, from that background? Um, so it sort of stemmed from what happened to Dad, really, in the sense that <clears throat> initially I didn't want any of the young kids having to go through that because the event itself and kind of what followed, you know, having to deal with the criminal justice system at the age of sort of 14, 15, it was an awful lot for anyone of that age to have to handle. And so I realised I wanted to do something to try and stop other youngsters having the same experience. But I didn't know what, and at that age I was like, well, what, what job can I do? So I thought about maybe going into the police um, for a while and explored that for a little while. Um, and it was when I hit 16, I kind of accidentally discovered politics when I was choosing my A-levels. So this is a story that I don't tend to tell in public. So, you know, your, your listeners are very privileged. But um, I was choosing my A-levels and was planning to go down a kind of maths and economics route because I'm weirdly geeky when it comes to maths mm -hmm. um, and I had to pick something else. So I shortlisted and I'd sort of watched Obama's election a little bit and found it vaguely interesting, but knew nothing about politics at all. You know, at that point I thought when Winston Churchill was Prime Minister he was Labour, so that gives you an indication of my lack of knowledge at the time. Um, so I ended up with four things on my list ranging from arts, business studies, PE and politics. And I sort of closed my eyes and went like this and landed on politics and now I'm here. 
So maybe an element of fate or luck or bad luck, depending on which way you look at it. But I wonder what you would have been doing if you'd picked, I don't know, PE or something else completely different. Probably fast-tracked into the police, I reckon. I reckon I've still gone down that route. But um, I don't know, yeah, it's just strange wondering about those sort of parallel universes. But mm. landed on politics, learned a bit about it, realised that I'm, you know, my family's values are small C conservative, joined the party and became one of those weird youngsters who spend Saturdays delivering leaflets instead of doing anything fun. <laughs> um, we did the fun as well. And then you went to Hull University to study politics for your degree as well. Yes. And that's where you met uh, the man that you ended up marrying. Yes. And that became subject of a Channel 4 uh, <laughs> show is, called yeah. Bride and Prejudice because there was a big age gap between you of 35 years. And how did you end up going on the show and why did you want to go on the show, do you think? I didn't initially. Um, that was the thing. I mean, obviously, from a, someone who kind of was interested in going into politics, I kind of am not usually a huge fan of bits of my private life being super public. Yeah. There are bits I choose to talk about and the rest I kind of keep it locked away. Um, and so my relationship was pretty kind of off limits um, for a long time. And we were approached by the Channel 4 production team um, who pitched the show to us and said they were kind of interested in, in having us on. And I said no. Initially, I was like, no, absolutely not. Um, they were quite persistent. Um, and we ended up meeting with them, having a chat about the tone of the show. Because the worry was that it would turn into some sort of Jeremy Kyle-esque, yeah. pointy finger, look how weird they are sort of thing. Yeah. Um, but actually, you know, through kind of looking the producers in the eyes and chatting to them, we realised it was more of a... Um, an informational piece about actually that you know relationships come in all shapes and sizes and showing people the positive side of an age gap relationship so we uh, eventually agreed to do it which was really strange do you are you glad you did it do you do you regret doing it at all it's just something that that happened you know we, we did it there were some fun experiences from it some bits less good in the sense of you know having to walk through the same doorway three times so they could get the right angle when all I want to do is try on my wedding dress kind of thing, you know. Yeah. Um, but it was, you know, it, it, was, it was what it was. It's in the past. It means I'm really good at getting a microphone on now, though. So that's, that's <laughs> probably a, a skill, a dress, a skill then, yeah. for, a you skill can, for you politics. You can get a microphone on any item of clothing. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the other things that you want to do as Prime Minister. Okay. Um, because you can appoint anyone you want to your cabinet. So if you... You know, want to think about anyone from history, anyone in the world, who would you love to have in your dream cabinet, do you think? Hmm. So I'd need my nan. And nan would need to be in there. I mean, she, she passed away in 15, but she was so ferocious. You know, she would take anyone on on my behalf. Really strong, proud woman. So she would be sort of number one appointment into my cabinet. Regardless of if it's nepotism, she'd be in there. Um, who else would I have? I'm going to have to say Taylor Swift now because I've, you know, definitely made a, a great play for her as an advocate of LGBT rights. So oh, she, what kind she of would be in there. Taylor Swift have? That's quite a good one. Well, there's, there's women inequalities, which I think she'd actually yeah. be, be really good at. Um, Culture, but, media, and sport. Maybe. Yeah. Well, obviously, given yeah. her incredible, incredible music. And are there any kind of conservative politicians from history that you would really want in there that you really admire? Probably loads. I can't think of a single one right now, but lots. I mean. Um, not conservative, but I'd have Joseph Chamberlain in there okay, yeah. uh, as you know, something to do with local government because he was an absolute hero in Birmingham for the incredible work that he did locally. So he'd definitely be in there. Okay, okay. And the reason I'm partly interested in whether you'd pick a conservative too is because for a long time it was kind of countercultural to be from the north of England and to be conservative. Um, do you think that's changing now? Because obviously you've just won a seat that was Labour right since 1935, yeah. has never been Tory since its creation in 1885. So something must be changing out there, right? That people suddenly are abandoning these kind of tribal affiliations with various parties. It is changing dramatically. Um, I know, having been involved in previous elections, you know, some people had sort of admit they were conservative really shyly, but not so much anymore now. Um, I'd be in pubs doing my series of pub conversations where people could wander over, ask me questions and kind of chip in, have a go at me sometimes. Um, and we'd get people coming over who would start out and, you know, they'd come across looking pretty aggressive and like they were really ready to have a pop. And then they'd say, oh, no, but I'm voting Conservative. I never have before. And, you know, my dad was Labour, my granddad was Labour from a Labour mining family, but you're our girl. Um, so the attitude is definitely changing. Um, and, it's, it, you know, so many people are doing analysis into why that is. I think a lot of it is, does come down to Brexit and that sort of trust aspects. You know, people who voted Labour for a long time, seeing that there wasn't necessarily a strong message from Labour on Brexit, so feeling a bit like they'd been let down. And I think once that, once that link is broken, 
it was kind of up for grabs who took that vote and I'm really pleased it was the Conservative Party because I wholeheartedly do believe that we are the party for, for workers and grafters. And do you think this is a permanent shift then because Brexit is a, in some ways a temporary phenomenon in terms of you know its political saliency, it's up there right now but in a few years time we might well have moved on as a country. Then how do you hold on to Bishop Auckland do you think? by delivering on the promises. And I think we're going to do that, looking at kind of comms that are coming from, uh, from number 10 at the moment. There is definitely an emphasis on repaying that trust that people have put in us, sometimes for the very first time. So we need to deliver on policing and on crime. We need to deliver on education. We need to deliver on the NHS. And then locally, we new MPs need to really deliver on the promises that we've made and on those priorities that we've spoken about. So for me, that's about our local health care and really promoting Bishop Auckland Hospital. It's about a particular bypass I'm trying to get built. So, Mr Chancellor, if you're listening, I'm coming on to you again. Um, it's about uh, our high streets and it's about youth employment for me locally. They're kind of some of my really key issues. And it's just making sure that we don't lose sight of that. And I think given some of the great new voices we have in Parliament who've been elected in 2019, I don't think we're going to let number 10 forget it. And who do you think will be the most dangerous Labour leader if you're looking at an election in five years' time? Um, I don't know. I mean, people say Keir Starmer. I mean, he's, he's fairly credible. But then you look at him, his background, how he comes across, what he's been campaigning on and promoting. And I'm not sure he'd actually go down that well in, in seats like mine and other blue wall seats. So I, I don't know. Hope, hope, hopefully none. Hopefully we're in power forever and able to continue our, uh, our great record of delivery. But we'll see. OK, well, let's get back to you being Prime Minister now and you can introduce any policy you like. So what is the one thing that you would do as, as Prime Minister, perhaps to hold on to those northern seats like your own? What is the policy that you'd love to introduce? So I think I, I would love a real emphasis on social mobility. It's something that's really, really kind of uh, close to my heart and something I think is so important for people in some of those communities that perhaps have been a little bit let down in the past. So I'd maybe set up some kind of um, cross-departmental department uh, specifically focused on social mobility okay. and that levelling up agenda, looking across education, looking at employment prospects, looking at um, infrastructure and that sort of thing. Uh, it's not, not as fun an answer as I know you've had before, but it's definitely, definitely up there for me. Yeah, and it is something that some Conservatives have been trying to look at. Justine Greening, for example, yeah. was pushing when she was here as an MP. And there hasn't really been that kind of in-depth look at social mobility. It has been split between lots of different departments. So. Um, I mean, the other thing is that, of course, Boris Johnson's talking about investing in loads of infrastructure in the yeah. north of England. You want a bypass. I do. Um, but what do you think is the solution to kind of connecting the north? Because there's talk about HS3, there's talk about all sorts of different yeah. schemes. Nobody really seems to know what the solution is to it all. And you're asking me as though I know. <laughs> um, I think we need to look at interconnecting some of our northern cities as a priority before you know, reducing the time it takes to get to London. So I'm not the biggest fan of HS2. I've kind of made no secrets of this. But I think the HS3 programme is, is pretty good. But also kind of reopening some of those smaller lines as well um, so that some of the kind of harder to reach communities don't have to rely on road transport. Because as we know, there are more cars on the road now, so the traffic's ridiculous. Uh, road kind of expansion projects are always far too slow. And usually you find by the time an extra lane's been put in, there's then demand for another one. Um, so I, th I think, yeah, making more of our train services are definitely one way to go. And what about airports? Because obviously you've got a local airport, yeah. Teesside Airport, um, and there's been a lot of concern about Flybe potentially yeah. uh, ending and um, having to close up uh, its business. Do you think that air passenger duty should be cut? Um, I mean, you know, there is definitely the environmental aspect to consider, but mm. I think we can definitely look into it and revisit it um, because I think air travel is, is really useful, particularly for regional hubs. So looking at things like uh, Ben Houghton's fantastic Tees Valley Airport, um, you know, there's definitely a demand there, but it's just getting that cost right. And when the taxes are so, so expensive, you can understand why people wouldn't naturally think to fly to London, for example. Um, so I think, I think there's, there's an argument to be had to look into it, certainly. What do you make of all the discussion lately about the kind of social values of the Conservative Party? Because there has been some suggestion that maybe the party will be a little bit more socially conservative to cling on to traditionally minded voters in the north of England. Maybe they won't be quite so radical on trans rights, for example, as the previous administration wanted to be. Do you worry about that? Because you're, you know, of the younger generation, so you probably assumed to have slightly more socially liberal views than some of the older MPs who are heading towards retirement age in this place. Do you worry that maybe the party might shift right on social issues? Genuinely, no. 
Um, we, I've heard this a lot, and I think it stems from Brexit, because a lot of the people who are quite vocal on Brexit were also quite socially conservative. So there was a view that because our party was going to be kind of flooded with Brexiteer candidates and new MPs, that suddenly we were going to have this huge lurch to the right. But then you look at the demographics of some of the new MPs we've got in, and there are a lot of younger people. Mm. Um, we've got a lot more LGBT people as well. So, you know, I think there are going to be strong voices making the case for social liberalism while still maintaining some of those great traditional values that, that we hold as conservatives. So it's, it's not something that I've really thought about as a, as a point of concern. Because you're a Brexiteer and yet you are socially liberal by the sounds of it. So you don't see those two things as kind of conflicting in any way? No, not at all. You know, for me, Brexit is a, it's about freedom, it's about opportunity, it's about kind of opening our arms up to the world, not about being insular. And I think people uh, who perhaps don't agree with Brexit tend to look at Brexit as being an insular thing and tie that in with more social conservatism. Um, whereas I think most Brexiteers are in it because we want to embrace countries outside of the EU as well, equally as we did with the EU before. Um, so no, it's, it's, it's not a concern for me. And as a Brexiteer, the other vital issue at the moment, of course, is whether Big Ben should bong yes. on Brexit <laughs> night. What do you think? I'm a yes. I'm a big advocate of yes. Um, I actually signed the amendment that uh, Marc Francois put forward on this point, um, which raised a few eyebrows, but, you know, it's fairly harmless. Um, I, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, it's going to be a great moment in our national history. It's a moment of celebration for many. Um, you know, the 17.4 million, certainly, but also, I think, all those people who voted Remain and are just sick of it dragging on, they're probably also going to be celebrating the fact we can move on. So I'm, I'm all for it. I, I say let, let, let Big Ben bong. But it's going to cost £500,000 potentially. Is it worth it? I, th I, th I think it's worth it. Do you want to spend that money on hospitals or schools? Do you want to spend it on bonging? Hey, I'm, lo I'm lobbying to get that money as well, don't you worry. <laughs> um, let's finish with some quick fire questions because okay. this podcast is flying by already. Um, so just to get a bit more sense of your politics, mm -hmm. Thatcher or Cameron? Cameron. Yeah? Mm. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Why Cameron? Um, I think he was a great one for modernisation mm. and Thatcher at her time was a fantastic Prime Minister and some of you know her core values are mine. But I think Cameron has really helped modernise the party, move it forward to where it needs to be now and was part of the reason why we've won so many seats in this election. Okay. Donald Trump or Angela Merkel? Merkel. Yeah? I'm going to go Merkel. Are you instinctively suspicious of Donald Trump or you know he's doing great things for the American economy you can't deny that and he got voted in with a great democratic mandate great um, but I just don't think he's he's necessarily my sort of guy I'm not sure I'd enjoy having dinner with him Fair enough. others would but yeah probably <laughs> not my cup of tea um, dry January or veganuary neither no I like my meats and I like my booze but if, if I had to choose one I'd probably try Veganuary yeah. and be really miserable after day three. Um, <laughs> I like meat and I like cheese, but um, you know, it's, I think January uh, is a good time to catch up with people over a drink, so I'm never one for dry January. Okay. Um, would you give Nigel Farage a peerage if you were Prime Minister? Um, I think there's an argument for it. Would I? I? I probably would. I mean, he's done a great service for... Um, for the country, depending on how you look at it. I think he's done a, a great service for Brexiteers, certainly, and he definitely represents a pretty big kind of sector of our society. Um, there are probably people in there slightly less deserving, so yeah, wh why not? We'll, we'll, we'll give Nigel Peerage. I, mean, I suppose the reluctance sometimes on the part of the Conservatives has been that he ran against the Tories of yeah. the Brexit Party or UKIP, and so there's you know a bit of tribal loyalty, I suppose, and they think he doesn't deserve a peerage, but that, that's not a, a big issue for you. Um, you know, I certainly wouldn't make him leader of the party, <laughs> certainly not, in that sense, no. But the House of Lords is a great place for expertise, and you can't deny that that man has expertise when it comes to the European Union, how it operates, that sort of thing. So I think for future ne um, negotiations and our future trading relationship, he could be a useful guy to actually have there in the House of Lords. Maybe as some kind of Brexit negotiator or an ambassador, or there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a vacancy for US ambassador, do you think he'd make a good ambassador? I don't know. I've never thought about him as an ambassador. Maybe. I, d I don't know. Ask me again. Ask me again in a few weeks. <laughs> um, what would you do to relax as Prime Minister? Um, so I took up yoga last year oh, okay. and I'm really bad at it. But I found it was a really good way to actually turn off my phone, lock it away somewhere and just have a sort of hour of pure thinking about nothing except for what I was doing right there. Um, so I'd probably go back to doing yoga because I haven't done it for about three or four months and I really miss it. 
Um, so if anyone's listening and you can recommend a good yoga instructor, <laughs> then do tweet me. <laughs> do you find it's difficult to get off your phone? Because it's, particularly now being an MP, you must just find constant updates, and yeah. being sent briefings and tweets. and. It's, it's intense and you know, I'm a, a millennial. I basically grew up with a mobile phone. It becomes a bit of an obsession, but now that there's so much actual work work coming through, um, it, it can be tough to switch off from it. And especially as I'm quite active on social media, um, I use it as a way to kind of engage, be quite open and transparent to local residents. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you get a bit sucked into reading the comments to try and reply to people. And then yeah. you realize, you know, two hours have gone by, it's one in the morning and there's a reason I have bags under my eyes like this today, and that's because I was doing exactly that last night. So it can be difficult to switch off. Um, have you already kind of experienced some of the abuse that comes with being an MP? Abuse, no. I've certainly had people disagreeing with me, um, <laughs> quite, quite strongly, some of them. Um, but I, I've been quite fortunate, actually. I haven't had too much what I would call abuse. We, we've had one that we were advised to report to the police, which we did which was someone threatening, uh, basically, if anyone knocks on my door again. And because I had quite a lot of younger people and elderly people helping me campaign, I kind of wasn't willing for them to be put at risk like that. Um, but personally, I've, it's an awful thing to say I've been really lucky and not had any abuse, because that shouldn't be lucky, that should be the norm. Yeah. But I have been really lucky in that regard. I don't know how some of my colleagues have put up with it, actually. Um, what song would you dance to at party conference? I feel like it's going to be Taylor Swift, right? Ooh, so. ooh, no, there are so many good ones. It probably would be Taylor Swift, and it would probably be um, You Need to Calm Down, which I think is the ultimate anthem for people in public life. <laughs> and, you, and if you don't know it, go listen to it. Um, there's a bit in the lyrics where she says, um, say it in the street, that's a knockout, but you say it in a tweet, that's a cop-out. And it's all about everyone just needs to just chill and stop taking things quite so seriously sometimes, um, particularly when it comes to social media and that sort of thing. So I would be raving out to Taylor Swift, you need to calm down. Like but it? I like a bit of Springsteen as well, though. So there's, okay, a, okay. there's a variation. Um, and would you ever want to be prime minister, do you think? Yeah, I think most people who go into politics have that little bit of them that says, what would it be like? Could, could I do that? Um, in the one sense, it's an incredible way to kind of make your mark and use your experience to try and really make society a better place, make people's lives better. But I think the impact that it has on your private life, your personal life, your family, your friends, your mm. colleagues, I, I don't know that it would be worth that to me, to be honest. But I've only been here a few weeks, so. I don't know. Maybe try it's a ministerial role first and then see I how don't you know. feel. Wait, maybe get an office first and yeah. <laughs> we'll take it from there. Okay, all right, well, good luck with that. And thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a real pleasure to have you on. Thank you.